Hey there, folks. Just want to take a break here from all the horrors and monsters of Terra Time to remind you, dear listeners, that family matters. Family is the most important thing. We here at Evac Station think of each, uh, each other as family. And we want to keep this family together as much as possible. Head over to patreon.com slash evacstation to donate a little something to keep us from breaking apart the seams when one of us suddenly decides to go nuts and uh, murder a lot of us. No, 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 not me, not me, not me. The other guy. Uh, for less than the cost of expensive weekly therapy sessions, you can help keep us off the streets and safely behind these microphones. As a family. Again, that's patreon.com slash evacstation. And on with the show. You hear the beating of your heart, you know the scream is gonna start. Here comes the really scary part, cause it's terror time again. They've got you running through the night. It's terror time again. Oh, you just might die of fright. It's a terrifying time. The clock has struck midnight, and you know what that means. It's terror time again, and we're running this podcast all through the night from a terrifying sight. We are Ryan Metters. Hello, hello, hello. And I am Aaron J. Waseska. I'm looking forward to having funny names again here soon when the uh, new year, when the year, new year comes around. We're getting close to wrapping up 2018's recordings. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I can't wait to, you know, remember what joy feels like, because I certainly didn't feel it in this fucking movie. Oh, oh man. Well, the good news, uh, the good news, man, is uh, next week, while everyone else is listening to Halloween, we're actually going to be recording, uh, what, what is it, um, two uh, Christmas movies to get set for the de- December rush. I know. It, I can laugh and be joyous. For those listening, that means we're listening, to, we're watching Christmas movies in October. We are fucked up. I know this. <laughs> uh, Timey wimey Chicago Astro. It's it's just recording things. It, it, it happens. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm also looking forward to getting some other segments back in, like the what you watch and all that stuff. Uh, but these like one off like little fun funsies we do for holidays. It, it's good. I think I think it's good to branch out a bit, try new things. So instead of what you're watching this week, as as like we've been doing with all of our horror movies, uh, we're gonna actually discuss um, Ryan. What is the scariest thing a family member has done to you or has just done around you? The scariest thing a family member has done around you. Or to you. Whichever floats your boat. I mean, we're not going to try to get into the deep-seated problems that uh, Uncle Lester, you know, might have done, but... uh... Oh, Lord. (laughs) Oh, I, um, I, I I don't mean to make light of that. I actually do know people who ha- are in those kind of situations or have been in those situations growing up. And uh, I'll admit, no, no laughing matter, but, uh, you know, just wanted to break the ice a little bit here. <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> Fuck. There was a time where a cousin of mine tried to set me on fire. Oh boy, I think you've got me beat once Um, again. (laughs) Um, uh, He wasn't, like, really serious about it. He was just being an asshole and playing around with uh, uh, one of those, like, long lighters that you use to light a grill. You know what I mean? Okay, okay. And uh, a bit of my... He was fucking around with it and, like, trying to scare me, and he accidentally set a bit of my shirt on fire. Um, and after I hurriedly put that out, I, uh, I proceeded immediately to beat the shit out of him. It was the first time I had ever actually beat the shit out of somebody, but I did it because you're not going to set me on fire in my own goddamn house. And then my mom beat the shit out of him. I mean... And then his mom beat the shit out of him. I mean, that's fair. And then his uncle beat the shit out of him. So he, he, you know, he got that ass looking like five times over, but... Yeah, they Sounds go. like he deserved it quite a bit, though. <laughs> he really did, you know? He was a bit of an asshole. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific situation. The only one that comes to mind for me... So, I was maybe, like, six or seven. I was a, little, I was a weak kid that's, it, when this happened. Um, I don't even think my brother was born, so I might have even been, like, four. But I want to say I was a little older. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I was with my family out in the Quad City area. 
Uh, for those who don't know, that's between Des Moines, or that's between uh, Iowa and Illinois, like right on the Mississippi River. And um, uh, so with my cousins, they were both, uh, I believe they were both teenagers at the time, maybe preteens, but definitely one of the, the older of the two was a teenager, uh, the older sister, I should say. And uh, they were watching me. My mom and dad were out doing stuff with other members of the family. And uh, my older cousin, uh, Tara, who I, I'll, I'll th throw her name in there because I'm sure she'll never hear this. Um, <laughs> she, she, she's, she's not on the internet much as far as I know, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I might get called out here next channel reunion. Anyway, uh, so she thought it was a fun idea to try to pull some spooky little prank on me. And I don't remember how it was set up because obviously I was the pranky, not the pranker. But uh, I was... Uh, Hanging out with my other cousin, who I will not—I I won't name her. I'll—I'll I'll, I'll let her know she's innocent. No, no name dropping here. And um, of course, I guess there's no really hiding who she is with her sisters. Whatever. The point is, I was hanging out with her. <laughs> we, we were doing stuff, and uh, all of a sudden we heard like noises upstairs, and I was like, "What the hell is that all about?" And so we both go upstairs, and we're looking around for for what was going on. And my cousin Tara, all get up in a ghost costume, you know, with the classic sheet over the whole body thing comes out of, like, nowhere and just spooks the shit out of me as a kid. And I'm freaking out, because I, like, had no, like, never had this happen before. I'm the, I, I, I definitely think I was maybe four or five at this time. My brother was not old enough to do these kind of pranks with me either, so no, no bar set for this is to, like, th expect this to happen. As I was freaking out, I remember, uh, the younger sister was chewing out the older sister, uh, was chewing out Tara for doing it, and it was, it was just kind of funny in hindsight looking back on it, just... Man, it's so tame and simple, but, like, as a little kid, that freaks you out, you know? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I got you. I got you. And you know what? In hindsight, I'm actually remembering something that was more scary than mean, like, rather than mean-spirited than potentially being set on fire. When I was about the same age, my older cousins, who were, like, 12 years older than me, um... At the time, I was pretty afraid of dogs because I was allergic to them and, and they just genuinely didn't really like me when I was around them. And they had a husky. Uh -huh. uh, so long story short, uh, they both grabbed me when I was young and tried to beat me to their dog. And it was really scary. That sounds fucking horrible. It was horrible, man. I mean, I mean, the dog was, was in no way, shape, or form threatening. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like... My mind was racked with terror, and I was not amused. Yeah, I, I hear that. I hear that. Um, so yeah, I guess we should talk about today's movie, which is all about family doing spooky shit. Uh, Must we? Yeah, I think we do. I think we do. We owe it to the people, Ryan, who want to know about Hereditary. Well, you know what? I, I done watched this goddamn movie, so I figure we might as well talk about it. Uh, your eyes don't deceive you. The clock still says it's terror time, and we have yet another frightening film for you tonight. It is 2018's Hereditary. Yeah, we have a handful of recent releases for you this year, th this season. It's going to be great. Uh, directed by Ari Aster, this film went on to make 79275000 worldwide, which is about eight times what it cost. Not the record breaker we've had before. Uh, this, in this season, but still, not bad. Not bad. Still pretty good, yep. yeah. Um, it's a hell of a return on investment. Oh, yeah. Honestly, horror films are the best way to get a return on investment. If you go in cheap and make something that's at least fun, you're guaranteed to get some good money back on that. Uh, this film stars Alex Wolf, Gabriel Byrne, Br Bu Bur I think it's Byrne, uh, Tony Collette. It's, it's Byrne. Byrne. Okay. Tony Collette, Millie Shapiro, and Mallory Bechtel. Uh, the film received a few nominations but has only won one for Best Actress in, uh, from the International Online Cinema Awards. And honestly, Toni Collette, she deserved that award. She did a fucking yeah, great she, job. Yeah, she, 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 she was going in on this role. She committed hard. Um, yeah. So as a bonus fact for you, Ryan, uh, in, the, in Peter's first scene at school, the words, Escaping Fate, is on the chalkboard with the teacher discussing it. This is a reference to Halloween, 1978, where the main cool. character discusses the same thing. Appro uh, appropriately, this film was released on the same day as a trailer for Halloween 2018. <laughs> Wonder if we'll talk about that one anytime soon. I don't know. Nah. nah. Tune in next week to find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Ryan, what are your initial thoughts on this one? God damn it. Um, so, I'm torn because I think as a horror film, this movie 
does a lot of amazing things. It does. It I really think does. it does. Uh, it it has a, has an amazing grasp on building suspense. <coughs> um, I think it really uses quiet, unsettling things to just ratchet up the tension, and it holds back on jump scares at least till the very end, which I think is really really cool. Doing like getting that much scary nonsense out of simple like tension building things that being said i fucking hated this movie because it was too <laughs> spooky for me i lo- i was losing my mind and i wasn't enjoying watching it for th- so i'm torn that's my initial thought. so for those listening uh i was uh with uh, amanda last night and we were watching some- we were uh, i was writing some stuff uh getting my schedule set up for 2019 she was working on some other stuff and i think i was also in between other things and um, I get texts from Ryan over the course of maybe like two hours, just at various points of the film, asking me like, "What the fuck's happening? What the, what is this? Her head's off. For the, her, her head just got taken off. All sorts of other crazy shit." I just laughed my ass off. I shared it with Amanda too, and she was just laughing too because she watched it with me, and we both had a good time with that. It was great. Yeah, I essentially <laughs> live tweeted this to Aaron because I was not amused, and I needed somebody to be with me. I'm in I'm in a solo fucking apartment. Why would you have me watch this? Not gonna lie, Ryan. I had to sleep with the lights on, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, not gonna lie, Ryan. Uh, after I read that, uh, read those to Amanda, she kind of made the suggestion we need to watch a movie with you in person live at some point. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, man. Oh. I, I told her, I told her, next year he'll be in town for the wedding. There's a good chance we can make that happen. Oh. I would recommend that it's something that you guys have seen that I haven't because I react kind of big and I might distract you and I'm sorry. I will find something. Don't you worry. I will find something. Um, oh, oh. Ah, fuck. Alright, that was my initial thought. Fucking, what, what, did you, what did you think about this? Man? Okay, so a lot of people compare this to Shining, a movie I absolutely adore. And the first two acts of this film have great cinematography and great moments that definitely put it on that same level as The Shining. Great angles, great lighting, a lot of good stuff. For me, that final act of the last 30 minutes, it doesn't work for me at all. And I have reasons for this. Really? But, like, the last act, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie, Ryan, Amanda and I spent more time laughing at it than we did actually getting spooked by it. Really? Yeah, we just were like, what the fuck is this bullshit? <laughs> alright, alright, that's interesting. I, gr- I, I can't wait to hear you go, go in depth on it. Yeah. Granted, I had a good time with it overall. Um, the first two acts, like I said, great stuff, and if you really like horror... Those are the best two things to take out of this. The third act, I've heard, I listened to other podcasts before this, and it's very hit or miss. Some people really love it, others really hate it. We're gonna dive in tonight and see where, we're, where we land on this when we're all done. Yeah, but just, just, just for everybody to be aware, this is a movie for for serious horror films, like horror fans. Like if you just, if you occasionally like a good horror movie, I don't know, man. This, this this gets serious. This is a serious horror you, film. You, I didn't know there was a difference, but God damn it, I am aware now, because that was terrifying. Oh, yeah, there, there, uh, there's three levels of horror films, I think. You have your shitty-ass, like, this was never meant to be a good movie horror film, which is like your your, your schlock horror, basically. It, 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 it's yeah. cheap as shit. You have your slashers and your B-films. Those are like your, 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 your Friday the 13th and whatnot, where... It's more gore than it is spooky, but it does shock you quite a bit. And then there's this and The Shining, which go out of their way to fuck with your head. And these are the ones I like the most because I, it, it takes you, to, it, it, it this takes you to where Silent Hill is. It really jumps in your head and really scrambles with you a little bit. It's really diving in symbolism and psychology in ways that most films are just kind of too nervous to do, and I like that a lot. Yeah, this is this. Ugh, I'm sorry, man. You you've got a synopsis, but goddamn, this is this this movie was. Ugh, oh, I got a good ugh. I got a good synopsis here for you. Are you ready for it, Ryan? Let's 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 hear it, man. I can use a laugh. Can you please make me laugh? Oh, I I intend this? to. Little swig of water for the prep here. Here we go. With the racist grandma dead, the Graham family is left to mourn her loss. Annie, the mother, is unable to feel anything as she has had a bad history with her mom. I almost I wrote grandma for some reason. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking there. Uh, Steven, the father, tries to be the stable rock of the family, but when he but he has to lie about weird shit happening, uh, like a, a desecrated grave. 
Peter, the <laughs> eldest son, just blazes every day. Hashtag blunts for Jesus 420. Uh, 420? And Charlie, the autistic daughter, presumably, is the one who seems to be having the rough time with the loss. She mutilates dead birds and has a weird feeling... Uh, uh, has a weird feeling something or someone is following her. Meanwhile, Annie is going to group therapy, lying about where she is and doing her day job of making miniature sceneries, most of which takes place, or most of, most of which makes uh, now uh, most of which she makes now is inspired by the recent loss and events taking place. That was a really oddly constructed sentence. I apologize. <laughs> One night, a, a happening party is taking place, and Peter wants to get his obviously virgin dick wet. I mean, who doesn't? Am I right, guys? Come on. Uh, however, his mom doesn't want him drinking, so his sister is forced to go. That's logical for you. Uh, she doesn't want to, but Annie uh, thinks that she needs a night out to get help, uh, get some help over the recent loss of her grandma. I think I should point out here that Charlie's allergic to nuts. This is important because at this uh, party, uh, there's some nuts baked into the cake. Uh, panicked, Peter races Charlie to the hospital, but an accident occurs along the way, and Charlie loses her head. Quite literally. <coughs> a freaked out Peter just can't deal with this and heads home to process, leaving the body in the car for the next morning for her mo her his mom to find. I thought I thought folders in your cup was the best way to wake up, but uh, no, that's, that'll wake you up too. Stop. <laughs> Another funeral and more attempts at group therapy happen. And he meets Joni in the parking lot of uh, for therapy and the two become something like friends. Meanwhile, Peter is seeing visions and hearing noises, which appear to be manifestations of guilt. Uh, the mother begins sleepwalking, which freaks him out even more, and the father is stressing out harder uh, to hold on, to try to hold everything together. Uh, it all comes to a head when Joni tells Annie how to perform a seance to reach her dead daughter. Thus, we enter in Act 3. Annie forces uh, a seance on her family, which causes the manifestations Peter sees to become more violent and aggressive. They threaten him. The sleepwalking appears to be more problematic than originally anticipated. Peter literally beats himself up, and Annie finds drawings of a dead Peter in Charlie's old notebook. And a dead body in their attic! Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, she tries to explain this to Steve, asking him to burn the notebook and get rid of the spiritual connection. This backfires horribly, and Stephen dies uh, burning on in, uh, up in a cloud of smoke. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> In the final scene, Peter awakens and explores the house. His mom, or so we think, is flying around in the background. Uh, he finds his dead father and then retreats into the attic where his mother is trying to kill him. Uh, the attic, uh, in the attic, he meets naked people, watches his mom kill herself, and then commits suicide with all this weird shit happening. He just can't deal, man. He just can't deal. Uh, but he stands back up after a ball of light enters his body. The spirit of Charlie has entered into his, in his vessel and is crowned by a cult as one of the eight kings of hell. The movie ends. I, I'm not even joking. This is what the, what the hell just happened here. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 a movie. <laughs> that is a movie there. So, so I don't want you to be rude about the ending. I, I like I said, other people have said on podcasts I've listened to that it works and they like it. And you know what? You guys have found a way to make it work for you. That's great. Me personally, having seen it, having listened to podcasts, I think... If I rewatched the film and saw all the clues leading up to it, because there are clues planted in the film that I didn't necessarily catch or think they were related to the ending, uh, it makes it work a little bit better. Um, like what? So go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but what it like? What exactly about the third act did you not dig? <coughs> were you not? Or are you not buying the satanic? cult reveal um, or was it just mom flying around that made you laugh the mom flying around had us laughing from the minute it happened like we, when she was like <laughs> floating through the air behind him in his bedroom out in the hallway both a man and i could not help but crack up laughing it was just like look so ridiculous um but then when the cult happened it didn't help me very much like i'm watching this and i'm thinking to myself okay you had this cult this whole time and yet Except for when Joni did some things late in the movie, we never really got that impression they were there. And then once they, we revealed they were there, it's like, oh, they were there the whole time? Where were they? I never saw them at all. And I don't know, I feel like it was maybe too subtle in that respect. Like, I never really felt like it was a cult going on. I felt like it was just like the this family stumbled into something they weren't supposed to get into. But based on everything I've been reading and based on all the background stuff... It sounds like the cult was actually manipulating these people from, like, before the movie even happened. 
Yeah, so my my read on it, so I will say from the moment that um, Annie first opens the book on spirituality and she uh, and she sees a note from her mom saying, I'm so sorry for the loss you're going to experience, but the gain that we'll get is so much greater. Instantly, I was like, okay, so she's a diabolist. All right. I did. I said it jokingly, but God damn it, I was right. <laughs> what I didn't expect, I didn't expect the twist for Joni to have actually been a part of that cult. Well, then you see the pictures, and, though, and it's like, oh, wait, she was there, too? Right, right. So, like, uh, apparently, like, I'm not sure if she was there at the funeral but I, but the, the idea from a couple of YouTube videos that I watched on it afterwards is that when she says, I, uh, when Annie's giving the eulogy at the funeral, and she says, I see a lot of new and unfamiliar faces, uh, and that, like, and my mom would be, like, skeptical, like, about who are all these people that just showed up when she died, and she meant to say that kind of funnily, but she was super awkward about it. I think the it, the impression is that the people that she didn't know was the cult, and all the people there was act like were actually the cult members. So here's the funny story about that, though. So I didn't read too much into that because my grandpa uh, died maybe three years ago now, and at that funeral we went to the, a local AA club, which is where he uh, frequented because he was the treasurer there, and. Mm -hmm. There were so many fucking people there who oh, I've never seen or heard of before. He never talked about it or anything. And it's a, it was all because he like had such a big impact in their lives when it came to dealing with their uh, addictions and whatnot. And right. to me, it's like, oh, so she kind of had that influence in the community, maybe? Now, granted, when you get more into the film, of course it's not the case. But when I first presented that, I didn't think anything of it because I'd been through that before. I kind of like, oh, okay. I can. I didn't either. <laughs> like I, I like I. I kind of took it the way you took it, and just like there are a bunch of people there that she doesn't know, and then in, in, towards the middle of the movie, you find out that she was estranged from her mom until her, until Charlie was born. So it's just like, okay, it makes sense. She doesn't know a whole bunch about her mom's life, so she knew all these people. That's neither here nor there. But when. I watched it, and it was inferred that the people she didn't know at the funeral was at were actually the cult members. A lot of other stuff started clicking into place, like how they were just doing these weird rituals, and like that one lady like reached in and fucking like drew her finger across the the grandma's lips, um, and that creepy guy who at the funeral, smiles yeah. at Charlie as just like. That's weird. Yeah. Who the fuck is that? Well, I think, and I that think makes he's one of the naked guys the you end. see later too. It is. It is. So, like, 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 I didn't catch that right at the beginning, but it was one of the things that led credence to the ending to the third act. I bought the third act. It made a lot of sense, especially with the reveal towards like the beginning of the third act when she starts realizing that they were for real fucking cultists. And that Joni is actually a cultist who knew her mom. All of those things, it started making more sense. And it made the ending work for me. I still didn't like the movie, but it made sense no, no, from I, beginning to and end. I absolutely, and I absolutely get you. And like I said, I think if I had a repeat viewing, knowing what I know now, I'd probably be kinder to it. But right now, with that first viewing only, I'm looking at it I'm like, man, this just did not keep me... Engage. I think maybe just the lack of seriousness I took that with, combined with the fact that the clues didn't quite add up for me at first. Um, just like I said, I don't think I think it was a recipe for me just not clicking with it at the end. That's fair. Like, That's fair. But like I said, I think everything prior to that, all the camera work, all the subtle, all the subtlety, all the quiet moments, everything works beforehand. Though everything that we see beforehand. So I have a I have a question for you, and I know we're. I, I know we're supposed to get to the discussion, but this is a discussion question, just impromptu. Um, did you, like, when I was watching the movie and we got the, the we, uh, she was at that, she was at the first group therapy session and she was talking about all of these mental health issues that her mother was dealing with and then her brother actually dealt with stuff and then her father actually dealt with stuff. 
And as the movie went on and Annie was more and more losing her shit, what I was kind of expecting to happen was that Hereditary is actually like Annie developing the mental illnesses that her mother did towards the end and that that was the inheritance that she was getting. Like we're just seeing Annie go into madness as tragedy just kind of well, hits fast forward on well, it. Well, there's credence to that too because uh, uh, the son actually goes starts to go through some of that stuff as the as the film nears the end, and you're thinking, oh man, is he getting this down too? Right, but that all changed with the same. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. So that... <laughs> with the, with with the actually empirically pro- empirically spooky shit started happening. So 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 did you did you think that that's where the movie was going? Did you have any idea of like the like where the third act would go when you watched it? So I want to give a shout. What did you think? So I want to give out to a shout out to uh, Austin on the uh, uh, Wise Cracks uh, Show Me the Meaning podcast because he actually uh, pointed this out to me. Uh, it, well, I wasn't. I was listening, but he pointed out in the podcast. And I thought this was a very strong example of where the film kind of falls apart a bit, at least for, for my reading of it. So, uh, okay. going into it, yes, I was under the impression that we were going to be dealing with characters who maybe they weren't actually haunted, but they were maybe like possessed by this like demon that is their mental illness, and they didn't see reality the way everyone else did, and so the horrors are kind of built up in their heads and not necessarily for realsies. And I thought that was a really cool idea, and I wanted to see that play out. Um, and for the most part, it, you, it, it could have worked that way. Um, because you have all these different people around them, but they don't know who they are. They can't really acknowledge them. They, there's no addressing to them specifically. Um, you have all these weird actions each character takes that is their kind of way of coping with stuff, which, again, kind of makes sense for those with mental illnesses who they fight, have coping mechanisms that kind of help them grieve or understand bad situations. And... Um, even Joni could have been written off as, like, a manifestation of Annie's, like, imagination. It's like, oh, this is the person I can ma- made up to help me understand uh, l- my loss, my mother, and all that stuff. But when it comes to the filmmaking, there is one partic- pivotal moment where it goes from anything being possible as a, as a like, in their head experience to, oh, this is seriously actually happening within the narrative of the film. When she goes to Joni's place after reading the books, the notes, and seeing her picture and all of her mom's old stuff, she goes back to the apart- uh, back to her apartment, knocks on the door, and no one's there, no one's answering. And um, the camera then goes into the apartment and looks inside to see the uh, the 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 ritual surrounding. Uh, uh, is it Peter? Is that his name? No. What's the son's name again? Yeah. Is it Peter? Okay. Uh, it's, yeah. It goes inside to see Peter's photo surrounded by all this demonic ritual stuff. Now, if she had gone into the apartment to see that, that would have all been, that could have also been played up in her head, and I could have still gone for that reading. But because the camera separated itself from her, and we we left her vision to give the audience a look into what's going on, that indicated to the audience this is actually happening. It's no longer in her head, and I'm looking at this. And I'm like, no, what? What happened to this all being her, her fucked up delusions? <laughs> She's actually <laughs> what the hell? And you could have still played it off because then he saw Jody later at the school. Uh, or by the school, and I'm like, okay, so he's seen the illusions too. But like I said, the minute you see that that spe- the, the ritual stuff going on in her apartment without anyone else there, that is when you're like, oh, this is happening. Okay, so my reading got crushed pretty quick after that. So my my that that moment happened a little bit earlier for me. Okay. It happened when she did the seance with her family. Because Steve, bless his fucking heart, Steve, who was trying to hold his family together, was there and was witness to the fucking spooky, like, glass moving and all that craziness. Like, to the point where he's actively looking under the table. It's just like, how the fuck did she do that? What's happening? Why did the fire just go like that? Like, he was the impartial witness to say, nope, genuinely spooky shit is now happening. So this is no longer just in her head because I saw that thing happen too. But I could have played that off as he was either humoring her or she was misremembering the entire thing. I could have I could have written it off either one of those ways depending on how the rest of the movie went. But yeah, you're right. That's That, that was also a pretty big indicator there, so... Um, yeah. I don't know. I think I would have preferred it going with the, the everything's a delusion and she's just lost her damn mind. Um, 
That being said, I don't hate the twist they made it, where it's like, she's not really crazy, they're just stuck in this batshit insane situation, and by the time she realizes it, it's too late to do anything about it. I don't mind that at all. I just wish there had been more of a build-up... I wish there had been a better way to signal that was where it was going, because it just kind of was a letdown that the way I wanted it to go didn't happen. <laughs> That's, that's understandable, that's understandable. And no, this is not a Last Jedi situation where I'm disappointed with Last Jedi. No, I like Last Jedi for everyone listening, but no, no, this is not like that at all. This is just like, you built it up to be one way, you had all you had all the building blocks in place, I'm like, okay, I can follow, I like where this is going, and then you just basically tear down the wall, and like, nope, this is actually what's behind it, never mind. And I'm like, oh. So yeah, that was how I kind of read the movie a little bit. Okay, alright. Um... But uh, going off that, though, um, so, uh, let's see, we talked about the cult, we talked about that, um, we talked about foreshadowing, we kind of cut a lot of these questions out of the way pretty quick, that's pretty good. Um, okay, so going off the topic of Annie, then, since we're still kind of lingering on that a bit, at the end of the day, at the end of the film, do you think she's a bad mother? A Absolutely. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, you don't even have to finish the question. Oh, God, she was a horrible mom. I... So, here's my thinking. I don't think she was a bad mom in the sense that I don't think she was, like, actively doing horrible things, but I think she was being led into doing horrible things and saying horrible things. I think that the cult and her mother, by extension, uh, they kind of put her in the, and her family in the situation that ultimately led her to just this arguably self-destructive path and i think that so, so with this with the film at the beginning of the movie ryan you're with me right at the beginning of the movie yeah. uh the camera starts out in the the model room the little the the dollhouse room and it zooms into a dollhouse into a room that's supposed to be peter's room and then the movie starts from there and it never right, pulls right. back out and from what i've been researching and reading uh, this is meant to kind of symbolize that um, the entire time that we're looking on the situation and that everybody in the, in the movie, they're not miniatures, but they're metaphorically miniatures. They're metaphorically puppets being controlled by the cult. From this, they're, they're these small people being controlled by this, uh, uh, this outside force. So right. I don't think she's a bad mom if she was left to her own devices, but I think that because of how much influence this cult had over her and her family, it was inevitable that she was going to make all these horrible decisions in the first place. So, I don't I don't think she's a bad mom in light of the choices that she made with the situation. I'm at, I, I claim that she's a bad mom in the fact that the grief that we see her go through starts let, leading her to say some horribly fucked up shit about her fucking kids. That's what I don't like. Like, like having this having this conversation about how she can never forgive him because she can never forgive him for this terrible accident because he won't admit that it was his fault. And her having a dream that I never wanted to have you and that I tried to kill you multiple times. But I don't hate you now. I'm like, nah, I was like, oh my God, why? Why did this woman have kids? And it blows my mind because she was, she said that once she had her firstborn, she completely cut off contact with her mom. Well, that was because of the, 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 the cult thing. She didn't know about the cult, but she did know her mom was obsessed with having a, a young man in the family, which is why her brother, right, which right, is why right. her brother died. So I, it's understandable she'd keep his her son separate from her. Well, no, 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 no. Here, here, here's my here's my point though. Like, she she separated completely from her mom. So I don't buy that her having a kid and like the 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 interaction with P, like her interaction with Peter was manipulated by the cult because she left. She bounced. It was only when she had Charlie that she initiated contact with her mom and quote unquote gave her Charlie. So all of this animosity that she's got towards 
uh, towards Peter, even though it's brought about by the grief of her of and the, of the loss of her child, which is completely understandable. But all the shit that she that that dredges up, that's all her. That's all her. So I can't really forgive that. <laughs> no, I get you. I get you. I, I think there's definitely an argument to be made here. Um, but I, I definitely think that she's not mother of the year. I, I'll say that much. She's nowhere near. She is perfect. not mother of the year. Um, but like I said, I, I, I think there is some excusing to, to it because, like I said, I don't know. I personally don't know how much influence the cult did have, but I can definitely say they did sway a lot of what happened in the events of the film, and they, they definitely knew. With, with her being the daughter of, I'm assuming, the leader of the cult. I'm assu- yeah. I'm assuming they had enough information on her to to know what would trigger her and how to get everything the way they wanted it to. I didn't notice it in the film, but someone pointed out in one of the other podcasts I listened to, uh, the, the the telephone pole that Charlie hits her head on. It it has the mark of, of the of the cult. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and I'm like, shit, so they planned even that. What the fuck? <laughs> well, I don't think that that was planned by the cult. I think that that was demonic influence. I think that was the spirit of this fucking demon they were trying yep. to summon. Like, it, it, like, exerting his will. Like it, like and and having the tragedy happen, especially because so what I, what I've found out from my readings of podcasts and what have you, is that Paimon's soul was actually in Charlie. They did. They, 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 they like said from, a lot, yeah. from birth, like from birth, which makes a lot of sense if the grandma had like essentially was given Charlie. Like, since she was born, it makes absolute sense if she was able to prepare this child as a vessel for, for like, for the, uh, for, for, for payment. Um, it's also, and which is why, but it makes sense that she had to die to release the spirit so that they could get him in a physical male form. It also, it, it's also been, uh, it's also been kind of discussed and uh, theorized that the the reason that it had to be this this kid was because it had to be within the grandma's bloodline. Yep. It couldn't have just been any random dude. It had to be a, a male of this bloodline. Which is why she really, really, really wanted Charlie to be born a boy as opposed to a girl. Yep, and they dropped that too. Um, yep. Fucking Annie, she can't do anything. Right. <laughs> um, I gotta say, I'm actually really impressed with all the research you did for this one. I'm, I've got to applaud you on that one. I had to, I had to watch things to make it, to, to make it not just terrifying. It is just like, like this. This movie does a lot of amazing things uh, with. There's a lot of layers. Uh, a lot of layers. Like, like th- there's a lot of layers to it. Like, like if we set the story aside for just a quick second. I want to, like, the, the things that it does to build suspense, um, I really appreciate it because the things that they did to ratchet up the tension, it's like they lived in the silence before the jump scare. You know, like, you're watching horror movies, and it, it you get to that really quiet point where they don't think anything is about to happen, but you know in the audience, you know it's about to happen. It's about to come up right now. You're you're, you're gearing up to be scared, and they kind of live in that space. And it never feels like it doesn't pay off, but it manages to make that tension building the actual main attraction for the majority of the movie. That's pr- like the, the And that's pretty that? that's pretty good too because so many films out there in the horror genre, not not all of them, but a lot of them, are very eager to to, for lack of a better term, blow their load and get to that jump scare as quick as possible to have you jumping in your seats. But the thing they miss with that though is that they're cranking things up to eleven all the time, frequently, and it's hard to really continue being scared when uh you 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 are constantly being told to be scared. Like so so for example. Uh, I've had you play Five Nights at Freddy's, and yep. having played it myself a bunch, um, I'll say as much. It stops being scary after a certain point. Like, at first, yeah, because you don't expect it, you don't know the patterns, you don't know anything, 
And it's one of those, like, you just have to sit there and, t- and, under- and, and you don't understand anything. And once you've been subjected to enough of the jump scares, not only, not only do they cease to be annoying, but you can kind of predict when they're going to happen. So you're like, oh, here it comes, and you're not excited anymore. And I think with horror films in general, they've become that. They've become so predictable that you don't really get the tension. You just get the jump scares. And it's like, oh, okay, here it is again. Um, some films are still good, and they're clever about it. But then you have a film like this where it's just tension. There's a couple moments where it's quote-unquote jump scary, sure. But right. for the most part, it's tension. It builds up, and it keeps making you just sit on the edge of your seat waiting for something to happen. Whether it does or not, it's irrelevant. The fact is, you are on the edge of your seat waiting for it to happen. And that's masterful right there. Not a lot of things can pull that off and still be good. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. I would say... Like, I, I would say the scariest moments in the movie for me are moments of complete silence. Um, just like when Annie sh- uh, finds the, the book on spirituality from her mom, she reads that spooky ass note towards the beginning of it and it turns the lights off and she looks in the corner and she sees her mom just standing there smiling. That's it. That was fucking terrifying. I was just like, shit! I love those moments, too, because they do the same thing later on with uh, with uh, Charlie in uh, Peter's room, where uh, he's just sitting there, and he sees her. There's the click, and, and he's, like, freaking out, like, what's going on? And then all of a sudden she clicks, and then her head rolls off, and it's just the ball, and it's like, it's just that all in his head. Me up. It was so that good, though. It was so well do- done. Up. It was. And, and uh, like, towards the, towards the end of the second act, when... Uh, Peter is still obviously like really fucked up, but everything starts ratcheting up because the seance has happened. And that moment where he looks to his side and he sees his reflection in the mirror and his reflection is smiling at him. And he is not smiling, but his reflection is, and it's just silent. And then it's one of the t- most terrifying things I've ever fucking seen. And then it ranches up like right after that where it slams his head into the desk and shit. And it's like, oh, crap. It's, it's just so... It's so unsettling. It's so unsettling. Like, you, like you, can, you, you can take or leave the actual story that they tell with the diabolism and all that good stuff. That'll work for some people. That won't work for others. But the actual tools that this movie brings to the table as a horror film are top notch. Oh, yeah. Top notch. Um, and, and again, I'm referring back to the master class, it's got a lot of similarities to The Shining. It was a lot of tension, very few jump scares, and when they did have them, when those moments did happen, boy, was it weird. And this movie definitely carries that same level of of of, uh, of, of tension with it. It's it's impressive how they, how they were able to get away with that. Um, yeah, no, 100% agree. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we haven't covered yet, but I think we covered all of it pretty well. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was dumb and didn't come with trivia for this week, so I apologize. Um, instead, uh, we're going to take the next probably 15 minutes to discuss a trailer that just came out in the past week or so uh, for our upcoming films in March... Ryan, what do you think of that uh, Captain Marvel trailer? Ooh. Um, I, first of all, I love how dated it is. I love that the first, like, the, 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 the first time the 90s smack you in the face is when this person falls like into, like she falls into the the roof of a of an outlet store, and then the camera pans down and it's blockbuster video. I'm like, oh, they, oh, okay, I, I'm I'm home. I'm home. We're in the '90s, and I love the time period it's set in. But I think the biggest takeaway, or the biggest thing that I'm excited about, actually, is. I really think they're going to have a really amazing sense of cinematography in the movie. I like the, I liked the flashes that they kept taking from various parts of her life as she's trying to piece together who she was before she was fucking Captain Marvel. 
and what they were doing with that last sequence like towards like the let the later half of it and they're like piecing her together as she's growing up and becoming this hero it feels like they're gonna do some deeper storytelling with captain marvel on top of her just being a fucking powerhouse uh and like ridiculously like strong and shit i think they're gonna tell a really deep story with her and i am very excited for that um i agree uh, so I'm going to get my one sh- bit of sugar out of the way quick before I have two concerns. Uh, so, all right, all right. So first off, the sugar. Uh, the scrolls are in, and I love the one moment where she's, like, on a subway or a train or something, and she just fucking decks an old lady because, obviously, she's she a scroll. She punches an old lady in the face. <laughs> it's so good. Like, I hope there's more of that because, god damn, I just want to see the superheroes punching old people now. It'd be hilarious. Oh, my god. <laughs> Can you just imagine the Hulk, like, going into a retirement home and he just sees all the scrolls, like, I'm gonna put, break all of you. And you, just, you just see him punching all these old folks out of the way. It's, it's gonna be hilarious, man. This is fucking elder abuse, man. Come on. <laughs> this is bad. <sighs> well, I shouldn't have voted for Trump then, Ryan. Nah. <laughs> uh, okay, all joking aside, though. That's, that, was, that was good. Um, so I have two concerns about the movie go, 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 with the one trailer. I'm hoping a second right. trailer will alleviate it. Because I like a lot of what I'm seeing here. I think the visuals are really good. The, the actress looks really good. I actually redid the schedule for next year for our podcast because we're going to actually discuss her one Oscar win uh, the week that her new movie comes out. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Nice. All right, all right. Um, but anyway, my concerns. Number one. So when Black Panther's trailer came out and when Black Panther was being talked about, they made a big deal about it being the first like, African-American-led superhero film of the MCU. They, they pushed mm-hmm. it as hard as they could, and from the minute you saw that first trailer, from the minute you saw everything about the movie, you felt that, and it resonated really well. With this movie, it's the first female-led superhero movie of the MCU, and really one of the rare female-led superhero movies, period. And... From what I'm seeing in the trailer, it doesn't feel like that's a big deal. To me, it feels like it's just another MCU film. That's not bad. It doesn't that, lean into that's, it. That's not bad, but you're right. It does not lean into it. And I feel like that's going to be a little underwhelming going into this. Because when they did Wonder Woman, they pushed the hell out of that. And it was it, they marketed that one really well. They were very clever, very, very smart about it. This one, I feel like they're being very subtle about it. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I can respect the choice. It's definitely different from Wonder Woman because Wonder Woman is the was pretty much the was yeah was was the first female led super like major superhero blockbuster period. So it makes sense that Marvel's not trying to ride those coattails too hard. Like like uh, like Black Panther is the obvious exception because it's an African-based superhero and they're really going to portray an amazing, like, future, like, future African, like, civilization that really celebrates Black culture. And, like, you could tell that was, that's what the movie was going to be about. And Captain Marvel, it feels like they're going to tell a really good Marvel film and it's going to be powered by this character so i i can i'm not mad at that i think they're gonna do right by it but i think you're correct in that the focus in this movie is going to be on the story and the actress rather than any kind of political message that the movie might give and and that's fair and and like i said my concern with it though is more just so I'm trying to think of how I want to word this. Um, when Black Panther and when Wonder Woman came out, as they did, there was such a big fan for such a big, uh, big like uproar for both of them. Whereas mm-hmm. with this one, I've been reading some articles and looking into it, so that's why I bring it up as a concern. Um, people are saying, "Oh, it's gonna be the next billion dollar Marvel movie," but the problem is, um, it has it has as equal chances of being the next billion. Uh, dollar Marvel movie as much as it has been the next like Ant-Man level movie because outside of the comic fandom Captain Marvel's character isn't really that well known and you've and and so Guardians of the Galaxy had that same problem 
so to speak. And I feel like they've got to market her in the right way. Not like, don't be like Guardians of the Galaxy 2.0, because we already have Ragnarok to do that. Right. But um, you, you got to give us a very good hook, a very strong reason why. Why do I need to see this superhero film over, say, Shazam or Aquaman or Wonder Woman 2 or, or just rewatching the Marvel movies I already have? And as it stands right now, and I'm not trying to belittle the movie because I'm still going to see it when it comes out, but to the average, yeah, but to the average film goer, I don't see a hook yet that's going to pull them in over anything else. Black Widow, if they did that one, maybe because she's an established character, They're, they know who she is. But this whole new person that they've never seen before, I don't see the hook yet, and I'm hoping we'll get that in trailer two whenever that comes out. But right now, I don't see okay. it. Right now, I don't see it. So I think there are a couple of hooks embedded. As you say, for of course Marvel fans, but also for people who have just who have seen Avengers, who have seen Infinity War, because they know that Nick Fury before he died called on one person, and it's literally the only fucking positive note at the end of the film. Like everybody is dying, and we're just reeling because we've lost so many beloved characters, and Nick Fury is even dying, but it ends on that one scene that one shot of the beeper with Captain Marvel's name on it. So it's almost or Captain Marvel's symbol on it. So it's almost like people who watch Infinity War know that this is the this is the character that's gonna potentially turn shit around. So I think that's a hook. I think uh, I think her just being female and leading the next big Marvel movie that they're pouring a lot of money into is automatically going to be a draw. I don't think they need to lean into it as hard as Wonder Woman did or as hard as Black Panther did. I think just by her being female, it's going to be fantastic. And I think they're putting their energy towards telling a fantastic story. So that way it's like, it's not just oh, hey, here's a movie about a black superhero that just happens to be good. Instead, it's here's a fantastic superhero movie, and that fantastic superhero movie is driven and powered by a phenomenal female actress. Let's go. That's fair. See That's what I mean? fair. Yeah. Um, I'm going to wait for the second trailer to, to for, for, uh, finalize my thoughts on it. Like I said, this is just based on the preliminary for what entry got, and yep, it's, it's, yep, it's yep. very subjective change. And I agree with you. I think it comes. It comes out in my birthday month. I'm so excited. I, I like how you get that, and I get Shazam. We both get pretty good movies to go with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my other concern, real quick, and I'm going to be very brief, is it looks like it's going to go onto the amnesia plot a little bit, the the amnesia cliche, and I hope they do something creative with it because that's sort of been here, done that. Marvel has not done it yet, so that's fine, but. I hope they do something interesting with this amnesia bit, bit because I feel like it's going to be some of those things where it's like, oh, okay, we know where this is going then. Yeah, no, I I, I think there's a couple of ways it could go, and I think there's that. I think, like, it's Marvel. They have, like, unlimited amounts of tricks that they can pull to make it really, really cool, and a bunch of shit that we have not even touched in comic lore that could make something really silly happen. So... I'm not worried about it. Like, my initial read is that she was human. She was a fighter pilot. She got abducted. She got experimented on and turned into a warrior. And she lost all her memories. But when she came back to Earth, she was a fucking Kree warrior. And that's that's that that's my initial read on it. I'm sure they're going to do something fun with it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and it is another, like, positive I want to take from this. Um, it looks like they're going to be pulling from all of her backstory, too. Like, I read some stuff comparing her, like, powers and the appearance of some stuff to her brief stint as binary. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, they're going to pull from everything and make her, like, super Captain Marvel. Nice. Let's see where this goes. So, um, I'm looking forward to seeing the love they put in this character, because that should be pretty fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, like also the fact that the net, like, like Captain Marvel is canonically one of the most powerful individuals 
period in Marvel. So all of the females that we've had, actually no, scratch that because we have we essentially have two female characters in like on the Avengers: Black Widow, who is a normal human but also amazingly skilled and just awesome, and then Scarlet Witch who can overpower Infinity Stones because she's boss. She's way more powerful but, than she's been shown so far. <laughs> very true, very true. But it's going to be really, really cool to have a physical powerhouse, like, on Thor's level. Like, she's going to be essentially, like, the female power equivalent of Thor. Or higher, depending on how be, they do it. Or higher, depending on how they do it. And that's going to be that's gonna be amazing to see. Like, like we're, we're going to see a woman, like, do some God of Thunder level scrapping, and I can't wait to see that show. I actually can't wait to see the <clears throat> inevitable shitstorm from the internet that the, uh, what, what do you call it, the incels will have when it comes to her, because, oh boy, you know they're not gonna shut up. Um, uh, shit, I, 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 I tune them out, man, fucking... I, I know, but stuff. they make headlines, and it sucks because it's clickbait, and it annoys me that it's on my Facebook wall, or Twitter... Or CNN. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, th- dude, clickbait gets on CNN now. It's sad. Sad times we live in. Um, so we we got we got a good fifteen minutes out of Cat Marvel trailer. I'm I'm happy with that. Let's get <laughs> let's let's get on to ranking this movie, Ryan. So, uh, for those joining us for the Halloween for the first time, because you decided to skip it and you're like, oh hey, they're doing Hereditary. We'll, we'll listen to this one. Uh. We have a ranking system for our movies in general. We usually do a gold through silver thing, but for our Halloween movies, we're doing a simple one or two. Bucket or fuck it. If we decide to put it in the blood bucket, it's a good movie and we like it. If we put it in the fuck it category, we decide to say fuck it. This movie sucks. Moving on. So Ryan, I uh, came into this one a little hot, a little, little un- unhappy with this one. Uh, le- leaving this podcast, where would you put uh, Hereditary at? I'm still torn. I'm still conflict <laughs> because I think, as a horror film, this is a top-notch movie. It is like, 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 like fans of the horror genre, like they're like you will absolutely love this shit. If you just enjoy being unsettled as fuck, this is the movie for you. I am not one of those people. I I can enjoy horror films. I can enjoy them. But this just felt unsettling and bleak, and I didn't have fun watching it. I can appreciate all of the tools that it brings to the fore, and I think what it sets out to do, I think it does very well, in my opinion. But I didn't enjoy the movie, <laughs> so I don't know what to give it. It's it's both. Can I can I put it in the bucket and then throw the bucket away? Because that's <laughs> terrifying. No, we only have one bucket. Um, uh, 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 then I'll interject real quick and maybe I can help convince you one way or the other um, so I am still not I'm still lukewarm on the ending I really much am but when it comes to cinematography sound editing and, and just basic like understanding the scene the first two thirds even a little bit of the third act if we're being honest here it yeah. does so much with the cinematography that I can't help but enjoy what it's setting up. Like, yes, the ending to me is silly. I'll, I'll throw it out there. But when I look back at the best of what horror films have done, Shining, Mist, other Stephen King movies, uh, Alien, uh, Grudge, so many of them have a good sense of, like, just the scene, the setup, the, 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 the silence, the buildup, and the tension. And this movie joins those ranks. It joins the movies that ma- or are the master classes at it. And maybe when I come back to this movie someday to rewatch it and kind of, you know, see what I missed, maybe I'll be more, maybe I'll be kinder to it. But uh, as it stands, um, I'm going to put it in the bucket because I feel like, yes, it is something I will probably come back to someday and maybe have a kinder opinion of. But until then, it does so much right beyond that ending, beyond the stuff that doesn't work for me, that I have to at least give it that much. Like, technique-wise, it's, it's a solid A on that one. Without question. <sighs> you know what? I'll, I'll, I will join you. I will, I will also put it in the bucket because it is it, it, it does a lot of things very, very well. Just because 
I am not a fan of this level of horror <laughs> does not mean that it's not a good movie. It's not a good horror movie. And it is. It is a it is a fantastic horror movie. I personally didn't need to see a little girl's head decapitated. <laughs> but um you know, fucking Brian, the things I do for this podcast. It's been a rough twenty. There were for maggots you. on the head, dude. Come on. It's been a rough twenty eighteen for you. A lot of little girls dying on it. It was here. just ugh, stop. Uh, well, maggots on the head. Hey there, folks. It's Aaron here in the editor's desk. We forgot to put in the plugs for this episode. So just to remind you that you can go to uh, find us on our social media. That is Facebook, Twitter, or Tumblr. You can also find us on Steam groups if you're a gamer. We have one of those as well. Uh, you can find us on all, different, the, all the different uh, podcasting platforms, including Pipa, uh, Google Play, uh, iTunes, Podcast Addict, one of my favorites, TuneIn, Stitcher, and of course, there's also our Patreon page, Evac Station at Patreon.com. If you need to reach out to us with questions, comments, concerns, or if you want to submit your favorite movies and maybe we'll talk about them down the road, that is Evac Station at Gmail.com. Sorry for the brief interruption, and back to your show. Well, well, next year, or next week, Ryan, uh, we're gonna have some fun with a horror classic. We're going back in time, ladies and gentlemen, to. The f- very big, very well known John Carpenter hit, Halloween. Or are we doing oh, yeah. Halloween? Or maybe Halloween. There's so many Halloweens. You'll have to tune in to find out which Halloween we're Halloweening this Halloween. I'm I'm personally holding out hope for Halloween. So I I think the winner will be Halloween. So we'll find out. Oh, maybe maybe finger cross fingers crossed fingers crossed. Uh, the only way you'll find out though is if you come back. And we'll see you after the credits. Faces full of slime. Don't you know it's terror time? And it's terror time again. They've got you running through the night. Yes, it's terror.